Uh, I was born in Cheshire, just south of Manchester. As you heard from Mr. Murray, I come from English and Welsh connection. My father's side were Welsh. My parents um, were English-speaking, but my father's parents were Welsh-speaking. I was brought up by loving parents, but they weren't Christians, and we never had family worship, and we virtually never went to church. However, in the goodness of God, somehow I made it my practice as a young child to pray, usually every night. I believe I left off for some years as an early teenager, but went back to the practice. So, I was never an atheist. Things began to be important for me, in a spiritual sense, when I went to university. The only thing I ever wanted to do was to be a teacher. So, I went to university. Um, Newcastle on Tyne was part of Durham University, and I took a degree in Latin and Greek. I wanted to teach those two languages. In the first term of the first year, who did I meet but a young Welsh boy from South Wales who was the son of an evangelical minister and who was himself a minister, I'm sorry, preparing I should say for the ministry, and uh, who was himself a Christian. This young man befriended me very kindly and invited me to go to the Christian Union meetings done by what was then called the IVF. UCCF is the modern name for it. Now these were good, good meetings and the gospel was being taught and preached in these meetings and I had attended a Methodist church for a few years in, say, Old Cheshire where I come from but there was no gospel there at all. So the influence of this Welsh boy was very important in my life and uh, I remember about December of one year I went to a meeting which is very impressive indeed about the gospel and uh, I took from the meeting a little free John's Gospel which they were giving out to visitors like me and uh, late in December God began to deal with me in a way that I began to be conscious of you know it's hard to express this in adequate language but I knew about the end of December and the year was 1957 quite a while ago. I knew that God was beginning to do something in my life and I testify against myself when I say I didn't welcome it, I didn't want it. And it became stronger and stronger and stronger. And so after a foolish night out one day, on a Saturday night I believe, I took out this John's Gospel and I think from memory I pretty well read it all through from start to finish. And uh, it must have had an effect upon my mind. Well, we turn from December of 1957 to January and uh, of the next year, and what happened next was I began to come under real conviction of sin. And I didn't know what it was, but I felt absolutely miserable. And uh, I came to the point in which in a lecture being given one day at university, I just could not concentrate on what was being said. So I more or less said to God, I'll do anything to get peace. And I don't know how it happened, but words of the Bible came to my mind. Now, I didn't know the Bible, but these words came to my memory from some source. And the words were these, all things work together for good to them that love God. And I said, well, if that's the case, then I must sort out my life. So I got rid of some friends that were no good to me, and I wrote one or two letters to say, goodbye, we're finished, and I stopped going to certain places that were not helpful. And I began to go to Christian Union meetings at the university, and by the end of January of that year, I believe... I came to faith in Christ, not without tears. It was a very difficult experience. It really was like being pulled, you know, from one's previous style of life into a new 
world altogether. So at the end of January, I took the train and went home to Manchester where my parents were living and where I was brought up. And I remember an interview with my dear father. Not an easy one. I said to him, Father, I've become a real Christian. Oh, my father said, he was a very kind man. Oh, said my father, it'll pass off, you know, like everything else. Just a phase. I knew very well, nothing would take that away from me. I knew it was forever. I don't know how I knew, but I did. So I said to him, Father, would you mind if I read the Bible in the family to you and to mother and to my sister? My sister Anne was six years younger than me. I was born just before the Second World War and she was born toward the end of it. No, said my father, you read the Bible to us, that's fine. She was a very nice person. He wasn't a Christian, didn't pretend to be, didn't go to church. But he allowed me to read the Bible and I did all I could to get my family to a good church. Mother came first and after a few years she was converted. She was a devout sort of person. And then my sister, i never forget this one. She was at the stage of being a middle teenager, say 15, 16, um, and she was beginning to like the things that I had liked before my conversion. And it was a Saturday night and she was going to go to the dance in Manchester. The dance, that was the big enjoyment, the dance. She was all done up for it as girls can be. So I said, Anne, the taxi is coming soon, isn't it? Yes, she said, I'm waiting for the taxi to take me there. I said, there's nothing in these things, you know. I've tried them and it's a dead loss. <laughs> she didn't like that. So the taxi came and she jumped into the taxi and she went all the way to Manchester, six miles. And then, to my surprise, she came back quite early that night. And I could see on her face it hadn't been very exciting. So I saw my golden moment. Sit here, Anna said, beside the fire. I'll make you tea and toast. Now that's my formula for happiness, tea and toast. So the tea and the toast were being prepared and she sat there, obviously glum. I said, wasn't I right now? There's nothing in this silly nonsense, worldly dancing. Christ is the main thing, you've got to get him. She began to cry, tears ran down her face. So I enjoyed the tea and toast that day very much, I can tell you. And uh, she came to faith in Christ and uh, she married a, fi a very fine Christian man some years later. Uh, I'm jumping ahead a little here. And the two of them went to Turkey and were missionaries in Turkey for a number of years. There were about half a dozen Christians in Turkey uh, at that time because it's very much a Muslim society. But I'm told today there are some hundreds of Christians in Turkey. And you know, the gospel is making some progress. She has been blessed with three children, all grown up now, of course, and uh, by the grace of God, they're all professing faith in Christ. And um, they're getting grandchildren, and they are now preparing, professing. And I heard just the other day that one of the grandchildren of my daughter wants to go in for the ministry of the Reformed faith. I was deeply thankful to God. What a privilege. Well, now, back to myself. When my sister was converted, she and I were working now on our father. <clears throat> now, my father was a clever man, but he never had opportunity to study when he was young. He had to leave school about the age of 14 to clean locomotive boilers. You know, these are the old steam engines that went puffing out steam as he went down the track. His duty was to clean inside them. Not a very edifying task, I wouldn't think. So, he could have gone to university, but didn't have the opportunity. So many of that generation, of Highland people as well as Welsh and English people, just never had the chance. They had no money. So, when my father was, um, let's see, about the age of 50-something, he said to me, can I teach him French? Because I knew quite a lot of French from learning at school. So, I said, yes, I'll teach you French. So, I taught him how to read the French language and... He quickly overtook me and read about 70 books in French, which I couldn't have done. But then, when I was converted and my sister was converted, we conspired to buy him a French Bible. And uh, my sister did something I didn't dare do. You see, girls can get away with things where their fathers or sons can't get away with. 
My sister once said to my father, she said, Father, you used to be a reader. You used to read all manner of books. But now, she said, that horrible black box, meaning the television, it was there in black and white, of course, there was no color television. That horrible black box is in the house. She said, she said to my father, throw it out, father, and start back on your books. I wouldn't have dared to say that to my father. Then being a girl, she got away with it, and the black box was put at the roadside, and it was thrown out. That was the end of that. And he started to read again. So my wife, my sister and I, my sister and I bought my father this French Bible. And he read it, and read it, and read it, and read it, till the back fell off it. And then we got him into a good church, not so far away. But the crucial time was a little bit later. I'll come back to the intervening things, but jumping ahead a little bit now. When I was uh, married, we managed to uh, have our honeymoon in Inverness. And when we were there, uh, my parents took a cottage and we skillfully managed to get my father and mother to come to hear Mr. Donald MacDonald Greyfriars. And my father had never heard preaching like that in his life. And then we got him down to Edinburgh, St. Columbus. Professor Collins was preaching then. And again, he'd never heard preaching like that. He was deeply impressed by these preachers in the Free Church's Conference. And uh, following up the story of my father, he was converted somewhat toward the end of his life. And uh, he took a stroke, latterly, before he died. And uh, he was in the hospital in Withenshaw, Manchester, a huge hospital. As you can imagine, Manchester is such a big place. And my wife and little girl, I'll come back to the intervening bits in a minute. My wife and little girl stood round the bed and spoke to Father. And I said to him, Father, I'm going to ask you a question. Not now as a son, but as a minister, because I was then a minister. I said, Father... Are you trusting in Jesus Christ as you leave this world? Now, he couldn't speak with a stroke, but he could hear, and so he nodded. I said, I'm going to repeat the question. Are you trusting in nothing but Christ as you leave this world? Nodded. Then I said to him, in that case, Father, it won't be long before you and I are together in heaven. Tears ran down his face. That's the last I saw of him. I believe he died a godly man. <laughs> 